Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, Dr. Music, who's going to talk a little bit more about therapies and treatments and in early stage disease, which I think is a lot of folks in the audience. But uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go along. We, we didn't do sort of a specific Q&A as part of the agenda, so you know, as things come up, hopefully you all will be fine with answering questions as they come along, and make sure you get your questions answered. So with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Music. Sounds perfect. So I'm going to talk specifically not just about early stage, stage disease, but skin-directed therapies, so things that are going to be directed at your skin. And certainly that's going to be the majority of treatments in early stage disease, but we also use skin-directed therapies in combination with systemic therapies, so things you take on the inside, whether it's pills or IVs, for people with late stage disease. So it's sort of applicable to both, to both groups of people. Um, I do did want to do a disclosure. I do um, receive uh, money from Actilion to speak um, on behalf of their product. Um, so what we're talking about is that there's a lot of places in the country that don't have access to dermatologists or oncologists that are familiar with this disease. So we have a group that I'm incredibly grateful for, um, both at SLU and WashU, that uh, take care of this patient. And without the whole group, I think, as many of you also know, um, you see many individuals over the course of diagnosis and treatment, and it really takes a whole group to get this done. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to talk specifically to things targeted at the skin. Most of the time, that's going to be early stage disease. So what Dr. Hurley talked about is early stage disease are going to be people that have patches and plaques, so thin lesions, um, that cover anywhere from a little bit of their body, 1%, maybe someone has a single patch, to you know their whole body being pretty scattered with patches and plaques. It's okay to have a little bit of lymph node involvement and still be considered early stage disease. And then again, we use a lot of these same agents for late stage disease just in combination. When we talk about treating cutaneous lymphoma, it's definitely one of these diseases where the art is as big as the science, okay? And I think there's a couple of treatment principles that I think probably guide people in this room. And one of the things is we don't want to make the treatment worse than the disease. And so that's why we're really glad that we have educational opportunities to not just educate physicians, but to educate patients that that's really important. We want to make sure that the treatment fits the disease. And I think we also, this is a disease where we have to be a little bit patient. So you come into our office, you have a new diagnosis of lymphoma, and you want it gone tomorrow. And that's just not the nature of the way this disease works. And I think that's unsettling both for physicians and for patients, because I'll be honest, I want to see your disease gone too. <laughs> so um, I think to not make the treatment worse than the disease and then to understand the pace that this isn't a disease we're going to make better in a week or even a month, um, but we need to give the treatments we have time to work. So just like Dr. Hurley, I put in some pictures. Um, so this is a patient with early stage disease, but I think if you look at this, this is early stage disease, but this looks pretty extensive, right? This is covering um, most of this patient's body, it's thin patches, so like Dr. Hurley said, stuff that you can barely feel. Um, and they call mycosis lymphoides sort of like one of the great mimickers. And I think here, if I look at this as a dermatologist, I could easily think that this patient just had eczema, especially when you look at the rash on the legs. Here's a late stage patient. My husband saw me putting together this talk last night, and he's like, well, I think actually this patient's skin looks better than the first patient you showed. Um, but this is a patient that's red all over and has blood involvement, and you can see the sticker on her bottom. So she was actually late stage and involved in a clinical, in a clinical study. So she's a relatively, relatively sick individual. So when we talk about skin-directed therapies, there's a huge list of therapies that people have tried for this disease. Um, the first thing is topical steroids, which I imagine most people in the room have used at some point. The second is topical nitrogen mustard. A medicine we rarely use anymore is called carmamustine or BCNU. Um, Amiquilod, which is actually a genital wart medication, is a treatment we sometimes use. And bexerotene gel is an FDA approved medication for this disease. We also use phototherapy, so two different kinds of light therapy. And then we use radiation therapy. I'm going to talk about the medications in red. Um, that being because when I see a new patient for the very first time, the most common thing I'm going to give them are one of those three treatments. Um, and that decision is going to be based a lot on what the patient's disease looks like and where the patient's from, what their lifestyle is like, that sort of thing. And I'm not going to talk about radiation because I have a radiation oncologist here that's going to talk about that. What kind of talk about that with us? So, first, topical steroids. So, I assume has everyone in the room used topical steroids at some point in the course of their disease? 
So how do steroids work? So again, this is a patient with early stage disease, really a single lesion on the breast. And why do we give you topical steroids? We give them to you because they're anti-inflammatory. We also give them to you because they actually kill lymphocytes. So they are actually doing something to the lymphocytes. They have some side effects. So a lot of times you'll hear when you don't have rash, we don't want you using the steroids because they'll cause skin atrophy, meaning they'll make the skin thin and wrinkled. They can lighten the skin. So if you're a Caucasian, that may not be a huge deal. But if you have darker skin and you're rubbing a topical steroid on, at least a huge white mark, then that is a big deal. Um, it can cause bruising in the skin. So over time, we know as patients get older, as they have more sun exposure and if they're rubbing topical steroids on the skin, that's going to lead to sort of bruising and purple marks on the skin. And then if the patient is using strong topical steroids all over their body all the time, there is a risk that will suppress their adrenal glands. It's rare, but it does, and it can happen. So I think a lot of you guys are probably way too familiar with these, but they come in multiple different formulations, and that sort of matters. So they come as ointments, creams, gels, lotions, solutions. And a lot of times you might have several different drawers and tubes at home. As dermatologists, we like ointments because they're the strongest and they're the best emollient or moisturizer. So they're going to keep you from being scaly. And we like the patient's skin to sort of be intact and not be open to infection. Things like solutions and foams have a role too because they're really good for areas where you can't put Vaseline. So something like um, the scalp is a really good place to use a solution or foam. Sometimes even the hands, we can put foam on because it soaks in, and then you have greasy hands doing the work that you're doing for the day. So if you look, this one is an ointment, so greasy like Vaseline. This is a cream. I think if you've experienced the steroid cream, they're still fairly thick, so they're gonna be much thicker than like a Lubriderm that you get over the counter. And then this is a solution. And the solution's gonna be alcohol-based, so if you are using it and you have microsis fungoides and open skin areas, it, it does tend to burn a little bit when you put it on. So there's lots and lots of different steroids. Steroids um, range from class one being our strongest to class seven being our least strong. And there's lots of different reasons um, to use lots of different strengths, but I put arrows at the ones that you're probably gonna experience having used the most commonly. So our strongest group of topical steroids are these class ones. We love to put these on hands and feet because the hands and feet are so thick. We like to put them on the scalp too, again, because scalp thin is really thick. Um, and clobetazole is a commonly used medication um, in this class, but certainly it doesn't matter which one of the class you're getting. Next, I know, again, probably a lot of people have received triamcinolone. Triamcinolone is nice because it's in the middle. It's mid-potency. The other nice thing about triamcinolone is it comes in a one-pound jar. So if we're asking you to use it all over, you're not getting 20 tubes this big trying to smear it all over your body. So we use triamcinolone from a very practical point of view because it comes in a quantity that someone with cutaneous lymphoma is going to need. And then lastly, hydrocortisone. So hydrocortisone that we buy prescription is a 2.5%. It's significantly stronger than the 1% you can apply over the counter. And a lot of times we'll use that for facial lesions. Um, so we're applying a steroid that's not quite as strong to the, area, to the areas on the, on the face. So those are the different groups of topical steroids. Who do I use these in? So if I'm gonna use it as your only treatment, if you walk into my office, you have um, mycosis fomboides, and the only time I'm going to give you one treatment, if you have less than 3 to 5% of your body surface area, so what Dr. Gurley said, like this, 3 to 5 times, then I might just give you a topical steroid as your sole treatment, okay? Otherwise, I'm generally going to use it in combination with other things. So it's nice to give to people that are getting phototherapy, because the phototherapy will penetrate better if people don't have scale. So we um, will go ahead and put it on patients that are getting phototherapy. If you're getting topical nitrogen mustard, a common side effect to topical nitrogen mustard is dermatitis or rash. So a lot of times we'll use topical steroids in combination with the nitrogen mustard to combat that side effect. And then again, we use it in patients that are getting systemic therapies largely to control itching. 
And again, to try to keep that skin surface intact so you don't have open wounds and things on your skin that are gonna make you susceptible to infection. I was trying to think of a time when I wouldn't use a topical steroid, and the only treatment I could come up with is we don't use it in combination with amiplomod um, as part of the treatment because it would counteract the way amiplomod works. So that's about the only time we wouldn't use a topical steroid in combination with other, with other treatments. Okay, so do people have questions on topical steroids? Because I'm guessing many people in this room have a medicine cabinet full of topical steroids. Yes. The um, amiclomod. Uh, yes. Uh, I think I read something about that, um, that it can actually cure it. So I haven't seen... I haven't seen it. I so don't consider curing any of my patients with my <laughs> So I guess I would talk about amiclomod as a cure. Amiclomod stimulates your own immune system uh -huh. to release a chemical that sort of gets your immune system to target the lymphoma. Um, I don't see the patient in the room. I have a patient where it did take away all the spots. I don't consider him cured, but he okay. still gets spots occasionally. It's, it, it comes in ketchup sized packets, mm -hmm. so I generally use it for people that have limited disease, but maybe just weren't doing well on one of the other topical therapies. That was just more your last. It's not something I pull out of the cabinet first. No, it would, it would be near the bottom of the list. Certainly as physicians, we have a group of guidelines that um, people in our field have put together, and it's on that treatment list of guidelines, but it isn't one of the first ones I would go to. So the next thing we're going to talk about is nitrogen mustard or methchlorethamine. So nitrogen mustard also suffers from having a terrible name, right? So it was first described in um, 1959. I put the original journal entry um, there because I think it's interesting. And what this was was they took uh, nitrogen mustard that was designed for you know internal use through the IV, and they diluted it. And people would take like the number seven paintbrush that comes in the Crayola watercolors, and they would paint themselves. Um, with nitrogen mustard, and that's how this agent sort of came into being and was first used. So it's what we call an alkylating agent, which basically means it damages DNA, and that damaged DNA then kills the cells. Um, historically, so these are historic numbers, it's had a really good response rate in early stage disease, so somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of patients will respond to this agent. And again, it's really effective for early stage patients or in combination with patients with more advanced stage disease. We used to always get it by sending patients to compounding pharmacies, and they would compound it for us um, mostly in aquaphor, and they can make it anywhere from 0.01% to 0.04%, um, and patients could apply it to the, to the skin. In 2013, a variation of this product became FDA approved. It's called Valchlor or methylorethamine gel, and so now that's a gel that you can get from pharmacies that's going to be shipped directly to your house that doesn't have to be mixed up by one of these specialty by one of these specialty pharmacies. So some things like I said when I'm trying to treat early stage disease, I really try to think about the patient and what's going to fit into their lifestyle the best. So some things about nitrogen mustard, one thing that's nice um, is that it can be applied at home. So if you're coming to my clinic from Cape Girardeau, if you're coming to my clinic from Arkansas, um, this is something you don't have to come to my clinic to receive treatment, it's something you can do at home. And generally, although it doesn't have to be, most patients apply this product overnight. Um, this product's unstable at room temperature, so it has to be refrigerated. So again, if I have a patient that's traveling five days a week, this might not be the best treatment choice for that patient. One thing people ask me, do I have to worry about it? Is it absorbed? So no, you can share a bed with a, with a spouse or a caregiver if, if you're using this product. And we don't need to check your blood counts. So we don't need to look at anything in your blood because this medicine isn't, up, isn't absorbed. Um, again, there's no, been no reports in caregivers, which is important normally to both the patients and the family. And then another question is, while I'm applying something on the skin that's damaging my DNA, am I gonna get more like other types of skin cancers? And the, act, the answer is probably not. Um, perhaps if you've had many other treatments for your lymphoma first, then there is a risk, but the answer is probably not. The biggest problem with this medicine, you say, well, then why don't we just give it to everyone? 
Well, because somewhere between 20 to 50% of patients will develop a rash from this medicine. So again, you're meeting a patient for the first time, they're already nervous that they have cutaneous lymphoma, and then you say to them, I'm gonna give you a medicine that's gonna give you another rash. And sometimes, you know, they think, well, this doctor's crazy. Um, so we have to manage that. <laughs> we have to manage on the front end. The other thing about nitrogen mustard is it's one of these medicines you have to be patient with. So six months, 12 months, sometimes to see the full effect. Although I feel like people begin to see effects much before then, they may not see the full effect until that six or 12 month time. And so here's a patient. I um, love to tell this story because um, we had known him for a while. We had started him on nitrogen mustard. Um, and we got a call probably in late October or early November, and he said, my cutaneous lymphoma has advanced, it's become terrible, and this is the look that I see in my office. And as you can see, his skin was red, it was painful, it was raw. Um, and we actually did a biopsy because our suspicion was it wasn't actually his lymphoma, that it was a, a dermatitis to the nitrogen mustard. So you can see, many of you guys have had this on your skin, like the circle sign that you're about to get a biopsy. We biopsied him, and sure enough, this looked like contact dermatitis. So we gave him steroids, his contact dermatitis resolved, Along with it, his lymphoma resolved, and so I tell the story, he then bought us Christmas gifts. So he's my only patient that we've given a rash to that's that severe and then brought us gifts um, for, for, for doing so. So I guess the upside is if you get this eruption from the nitrogen mustard, then it can be beneficial to the lymphoma. We'll leave it at that. Okay, so are there questions on topical nitrogen mustard? Yeah, please. It isn't about that, it's just it's about an ointment. Yeah. You use an ointment. It's rash goes away, say, for a week or so, where, what's happening to the T-cells when you don't see evidence on the surface? Yeah, so the T-cells in the skin are actually gone, okay? We don't do a lot of re-biopsy to prove that, so I can't show you a picture of a biopsy afterwards, um, but, but we do, and the T-cells are gone. But then there's probably some low level of T-cells somewhere still in your body um, that haven't been killed by the disease we're treating. And your body's own immune system, especially in early stage disease, is probably keeping those under control. And then over time, sort of another patch yeah, will see will see through. Yeah. yeah. It goes and comes and I just wonder what it's doing in the meantime. It's not it's Are not doing no no no, it's not doing something like sinister in the meantime. <laughs> it, it, again, your body is probably keeping in check and then for some reason some sneaks out again. And I think that's sort of the real challenge because it just never goes away yeah so the second thing we're going to we're going to talk about is light therapy and light therapy i think is a great option because you don't have to apply anything at home it's something we can take care of for you in the office the issue with light therapy is you have to have access within a reasonable distance um, um, to getting light so we're going to talk about what phototherapy is so phototherapy is a light unit they look like fluorescent light bulbs and i have some pictures and we have two different kinds of light units. So one that's going to admit UVA and one that's going to admit UVB. So the question is, what is UVA and UVB? This is the light that's admitted from the sun. Okay. When we think about UVB, we think about that's the thing when you go to the beach that gives you a tan and you get sunburned from, and it doesn't penetrate glass. Okay. Um, it can cause cataracts. That's the other thing it can do. UVA is what immediately makes your skin dark. So when you've been out in the sun and you come in like 20 minutes later and you already look tan, that's what the UVA is done. It's actually what's used in tanning beds. Um, it penetrates glass, um, it causes skin cancer and also photo aging, so wrinkles and that kind of stuff, and then it can also cause cataracts. One thing we take advantage of is the UVA penetrates a little bit deeper into the skin than the UVB. So bad when we're talking about basal cell, squamous cell, melanoma kind of skin cancer, but we can use that to our advantage in T-cell lymphoma. So here's what a narrow band unit looks like. So again, it's a circular unit with many, many light bulbs that look like fluorescent light bulbs. How does this work? So how does light actually work? It kills lymphocytes. So actually people that have deep sunburns, actually it suppresses your immune system a little bit. So um, the UVB is actually killing the, the lymphocytes. This works, so again, our numbers aren't great on this because there's never been a big study where they say we're gonna give half the people with cutaneous lymphoma light and half the people without cutaneous lymphoma light, but it works somewhere between 50 and 100% of the time. 
Again, patients have to come into an office um, two to three times a week. And then it can be tapered if you're clear, so you're only getting it about every 10 days or every other week. The great thing about Naraband GBB is that it is incredibly safe. Um, it's well tolerated. If, if, if it does cause skin cancer, the risk is incredibly low, and studies can't pick up the risk. It's so low. The problem with it is, is it's not good for thicker lesions. So if you're not one of these people that have patches, but you have thicker plaques, it's not good for that. And it's not good for people that have disease that tracks down the hair follicle because it just doesn't penetrate, doesn't penetrate that deep. The other issue with this treatment is it works great when a patient's on it, but when we're talking about the disease coming back, it's hard to ever take a patient off of it. So the disease tends to come back relatively quickly after we take a patient off. There are home units, so if someone doesn't um, have access to a facility close by, um, there are home units available. It is, the home units are sometimes covered by insurance. They run in about the $6,000 range, so it's something that insurance is sometimes willing to cover. The problem is you have to have room in your house for one. So they're about six feet tall. The ones we normally prescribe look just like this in the picture. They have three panels, and a patient puts themselves in the unit and turns on the light, and then they rotate and do the backside. So this allows for narrow band GBB without travel. Um, this is a great option also for school-aged children. So I realize we don't have school-aged children um, maybe in the room, but um, it's, it's a great option for school-aged children, again, because the side effects are low and it allows them to get treatment without missing, without missing school. When you're in a narrow band light unit, you wear what looks like swimming goggles to protect your eyes from the narrow band radiation. So the next treatment that we give are UVA units, and we call it UVA PUVA. PUVA is for the pill we give before called Sorolin. So you use Sorolin with UVA. UVA alone doesn't work, okay? So we give a drug called Aid-Methoxorolin, um, and you give it one and a half hours prior to getting in the light unit. One of the big issues with this is, once you take that pill, you need to protect your eyes with sunglasses for the rest of the day. So you have to continually protect your eyes after you see it. There's some risk associated with PUVA that's not associated with Naraband. So when you get to about 200 to 250 treatments of this PUVA therapy, there's an increased risk of skin cancer, and not just basal cells and squamous cells, but melanoma, so the deadliest form of skin cancer. Um, it's also associated with wrinkles and freckling, and that's often severe. Patients, when they first get into the unit, sometimes they feel worse and not better because they're itching from the heat of the unit. Um, and then the pills often make people feel nauseous, so we have to recommend people take milk or ginger when they're taking the pills. One thing that's sort of nice, while you initially are treated two or three times a week with this, one thing that's great about it is it can be tapered to once a month. So you can come in very infrequently and still get treated, still get treated with PUVA. So when I list the side effects, you wonder, well, why do we use this treatment at all? You know, you just listed a whole bunch of things that are really bad about it. The question is, why do you use it? And we use it because it really works. So this is a disease when we give patients a lot of medicine that work 30% of the time, 60% of the time. But when you look at the numbers for PUVA, you were talking 90. 75, 80, so they work a large percentage of the time. So despite all the side effects with this treatment, um, there's a big payoff. So this is when you really have to talk to your doctor about the risks and benefits of particular, particular diseases. And then the other thing that we have available is hand and foot units. So your skin is looking pretty good all over but you have still cracking and fissuring on the hands and feet, we can actually just treat the hands and feet. And there's both type of units. So there's narrow band, so there's the UVB kind of units where you don't have to take a pill before. And then there's the UVA treatments where you either take a pill or you put on a lotion that has that sore one in it and you can put your hands and feet in the unit. So that's another option if you need a boost or an extra treatment to just one particular part of the body. So just some general things about phototherapy. Um, PUVA, I would say, is very effective. That's one of the pros. It can be tapered to monthly, which I don't know about you, but coming to the doctor once a month as opposed to three times a week is appealing. 
Uh, the downsides is there's an increased risk of skin cancer, and it's real. Um, nausea can be very real for patients. And then there's limited access. The PUVA boxes are generally at large academic centers. They're much, much harder to find in the community. Um, narrowband UVB is great because it's effective, although again, sometimes the response is short. I talked about this, people can itch really in both units when they first start because the heat of the unit can make their rash and their itching a little bit worse. Um, with narrowband, there's minimal or no risk of skin cancer, which is great, but it's not good for people with thicker spots or spots that travel down the hair follicles. So that's all I have on phototherapy, and then I just have one patient to tell you guys about. Are there any questions on phototherapy? Okay, so when we lecture to physicians, residents, other people about this disease, we try to tell them cases because that helps them remember because we think about patients and so thinking about a patient is how, how we remember how to treat this disease. So this is a gentleman I knew when I was at uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And he had had a rash for 20 years, but had given up on seeing dermatologists. And he'd actually been to Grand Rounds, since we talked about Grand Rounds, he'd been to University of Pennsylvania's Grand Rounds, he'd been to Jefferson University's Grand Rounds, and he'd actually been to what we call citywide Grand Rounds, which was five universities in the Philadelphia area. And he'd been treated through the years with lots of things, including, including topical steroids and PUVA, but never really cleared and never really had a good diagnosis. And he shows up not in my lymphoma clinic, but just in my regular dermatology clinic. And my medical assistant came out and she's like, this guy has lymphoma. <laughs> she's like, I, I know he does. And he, uh, we walked in the room and he had no hair, he had no eyebrows, and he didn't even know it. He'd had hair, he had not had hair for so long, it didn't even occur to him that he didn't have hair and eyebrows and eyelashes. And then we see this. So he had on his body, you know, sort of like weird bumps that were clustered together. And then some scaly stuff on his lower back. And then he had no fingernails. And his feet were all crusty and fissured. And so we did just what you heard Dr. Hurley say. We took multiple biopsies from multiple things that look lots of different ways. And again, it wasn't to torture him. It was, it was to try to get the diagnosis. And we actually originally started him on, on PUVA therapy. He'd had PUVA before, but again, it had been about 20 years. So we started PUVA therapy. And he actually cleared. So you can see the scar from where the spot was on the chest. And same thing, some of these spots in the low back. The feet are still largely discolored, but there's minimal scale at this point. Um, so he did well. And actually, there's a rare side effect of PUVA where after you've had a lot of treatments, you can start itching uncontrollably. And he started itching uncontrollably. So we had to stop PUVA and um, start topical nitrogen mustard um, at that point, And he um, remained remain clear. So you can have good success in severe cases that have been present for many, many years just using skin-directed therapy alone.